Let's ball in the Central Committee. Let's cringe in the Central Committee. Let's bog in the Central Committee right now. Uh, hey, everybody. Our beloved mod, Sushi Mom, showed me this. These are the Google results for sewer socialism. So apparently, a lot of people did, in fact, start to Google it. It's incredible, because I want to tell you something, chat. It's a really, really cool and interesting and, quite frankly, encouraging history of socialism in America. Sewer socialism isn't just, like, uh, something that I said because I was trying to get a gotcha. It was a good faith attempt to engage with the question of, like, what do we do about cities like Omaha losing population? What do we do when progressives take over cities, especially in the Rust Belt and the Midwest, that have had a hard time maintaining their young population, have seen industry leave? What do we do? That is a tough question. There's no doubt about it. Anybody who says that they're going to wave a magic wand and they'll be able to solve the reality of deindustrialization is lying to you. Okay? It is a global trend. It's not a state trend. It's not a city trend. It's not even a national trend. It's a global trend. And these are very difficult problems. And when I said sewer socialism, I'm trying to reference something very specific. And... Quite frankly, most people apparently don't know what it is, which is okay. You don't, you can't be expected to know everything. You know, a lot of people got more involved in leftist politics through Bernie Sanders. And Bernie Sanders can't educate everybody about history all the time. He made arguments about policies and you found them persuasive. And that's important, but it doesn't explain enough. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, I want to talk about alternatives because one of the things that did come up yesterday is the idea of attracting big business to a city like Omaha by doing things like talking to the CEO or even offering what I was saying, TIFs, tax breaks. What are TIFs? Basically, they come down to you financing a development using tax dollars. So you defer a tax bill, like someone develops, builds a building and they don't have to pay taxes on it for years. So that is a way of incentivizing them to build. Well, in Omaha, they've been trying that strategy. That's a neoliberal strategy 101, okay? It does not work. It does not work. You can do race to the bottom shit all day. It doesn't transform. It doesn't defeat brain drain, population loss, deindustrialization, okay? Those are not things that a municipality giving you a tax break on property taxes is going to fix. And... Let me show you. I'll read this. To move its HQ to Chicago, ConAgra settled for less than half of the $28.5 in incentives that Nebraska was willing to offer. ConAgra Foods wanted to move its headquarters to Chicago so badly that the company took a pass on an estimated $28.5 in incentives Nebraska would have offered to keep it in Omaha. Now, this is ConAgra. This is an agricultural company. You would think of all the companies that might have their headquarters in Omaha, an agricultural company would be a good one. And it didn't work. Instead, the company accepted Illinois tax credits that were expected to amount to less than half of what Nebraska would have offered. The disparity of potential tax breaks supports the assertion by ConAgra Chief Executive Sean Connolly that business incentives did not play a big role in the decision to shutter its Omaha headquarters. The decision to move headquarters was solely based on the strategic needs of our business and not a city versus city exercise. But documents newly obtained by the World Herald also show that ConAgra officials told the Illinois state government a different story in the months prior to its announcement. This is a very important point. These ConAgra actually got tax breaks from Chicago to move its corporation headquarters from Omaha to Chicago. Now, let me ask you this question, chat. I want to ask you this question. Do you think that it's a good idea for our cities to constantly be telling major corporations they don't have to pay taxes if they mow, please, please move, move your CH headquarters to my city? Do you think that's a good idea for a leftist to advance? Corporations, you don't have to pay taxes. Just move to my city, please. Wouldn't that accelerate the worsening of shitty conditions and disenfranchised communities that are already incorrect? 
ConAgro told Illinois officials that tax incentives were needed to justify moving its office to Chicago. Illinois official must be convinced they found a way around a statewide moratorium on incentives the governor had recently imposed because of a budget crisis in Illinois. Look at that statement, chat. Not only do these tax incentives not work, they actually destroy government at the state level in Illinois. They tried to put a moratorium on this, but neoliberal politicians are so insistent on giving tax breaks, they found a way around it. ConAgra did not answer questions about why it requested and accepted additional tax credits during the moratorium. ConAgra's request of Illinois came amid a state budget crisis so severe that organizations serving the poor didn't receive state money and scaled back services, state museums closed, school administrators worried they'd have to close their doors, and the state lottery suspended payments to prize winners. An Illinois spokesman last year told the news media in Chicago that the state's offer to ConAgra came before the incentive programs were suspended, but documents obtained by the World Herald show a different timeline. So these neolib politicians were so corrupted that they got around a moratorium while the services were being suspended. Do you see why I oppose this? Do you see why this is bad neoliberal politics? Was saying the good gal was said he wasn't going to do in tax incentives. He was going to find other ways. Do you see? Okay. Finding other ways. Do you understand why that's a humongous hand wave and frankly laughable? What are the other ways that you would incentivize a co corporation who has has its employees in a major city elsewhere to uh, uproot those employees and move to Omaha, Nebraska? I would like you, in good faith, to explain that. And their answer is there isn't any. It's, it's, it's just bullshit. It's just a campaign talking point. I'm going to talk to these companies. Oh, that means you're giving them tax breaks. Oh, no, no, I won't give tax breaks. Tax breaks are unpopular for corporations. Okay, so how are you going to do it? Other ways. I'm sorry you don't know the other ways, but I there are many other... Okay, like what? Oh, I don't know. I don't know the other ways. And that is the problem. All right. So this failed in Chicago. So Omaha actually lost a headquarters that was already there when they offered double the tax incentives and the corporation left anyway because they wanted to go to Chicago, a major world city. So what can we do? All right. It's pretty clear that offering tax breaks to major corporations doesn't help. So what can we do? I live in a city with a GOP mayor in a red state, and our city has started beefing up public services and projects to keep attracting people from other states to all the technology companies located. It's interesting because they realize that tax incentives only do so much, and they have to make the city actually much nicer to live in. Ifea, thank you for that comment. That's exactly what I was trying to talk about. If you don't know a lot about municipal politics, you might not be aware of it. But let me just tell you that when I talked about annexing suburbs and what I was the larger topic of regionalism, you know, cities and suburbs have these artificial distinctions between them. Cities are parasited on by suburbs. Cities provide the jobs. Cities provide the infrastructure. Cities often provide sewer and water services for the suburbs that surround them. But what the suburbs don't provide is tax revenue to the city. What suburbs don't provide is tax revenue to the school district. Suburbs often have much better schools than the inner city core that they surround. Why is that? They have higher property value. So when they pay property taxes, it goes to a local school district that only has white children, and that provides them with much higher tax base. So what's an alternative to that? What do we do? The suburbs, white flight. What do we do to counter that? And there's been a lot of things that have actually happened already that progressives and leftists have done. But before we get into that, I want to show you sewer socialism. Now, I just grabbed some articles real quick to show you that this is not a topic that is some sort of like mystery deep dive. Oh, what? This is basic. And if you don't know it, that's okay. You're not stupid. But you're also not trying to teach everybody, are you? You're not out there saying you're an expert on socialism, right? This is not a big deal. This is an opportunity to teach and learn, and it's fucking awesome. And a lot of those suburbs were created for racist reasons to begin with. Absolutely. Aren't cities limited in the kind of taxes they can raise and often depend on both state and federal investment? Absolutely, Lord Bucketface. 
The war between the states to subsidize Hollywood. Yeah, this is this is bad. So that's why I oppose that, because when I hear that shit, I think neoliberalism. And it's not just a me. I don't throw the phrase neoliberal at people a lot. If you watch my stream, you understand that I don't throw neoliberal at people a lot. That's just baffling. So what are su sewer socialists? What is sewer socialism? Well, sewer socialism refers to a movement in the Midwest centered on Milwaukee, Wisconsin for a type of socialist who said, hey, I want to end capitalism. I want to go to the next stage of human development. But what I care about right now is helping the working class right now. I want to solve the issues that I can solve locally. And I'm going to show people you can support socialists. Because when socialists are in charge, you get good government. And the sewer socialist movement was so successful, it took over Milwaukee, Wisconsin from 1897 till 1960. They elected the first socialist congressman. They elected three socialist mayors. They elected extremely progressive senators like <clears throat> um, Paul Wellstone. If you don't know who Paul Wellstone is, that's fine. He's from Minnesota. Um, and that is the sewer socialist movement in the Midwest. Leftism and progressivism is actually not something from the coasts. It was most successful, believe it or not, in much of the Midwest and upper Midwest. Uh, what happened in 1960 that ended it? Well, yes, it's hoping to find opportunities. Uh, there was a merge. If Vosh was socialist, he wouldn't be scared of people leeching viewers. He would be happy to build off the left. Well, he doesn't care about that. Democratic Party didn't choose Milwaukee 2020 convention because of its radical past, but the city's history shows that so how socialism worked in the United States and could work again. It's only fitting that Democrats would come to Milwaukee, said Mark Jefferson, executive director of the Republican Party of Wisconsin, soon after the Democratic National Committee announced the location of the 2020 convention. No city in America has stronger ties to socialism than Milwaukee. And with the rise of Bernie Sanders and the embrace of socialism by its newest leaders, the American left has come full circle. Now, I know Mark Jefferson isn't a leftist, but he knew about sewer socialists. He knew about socialism in Wisconsin. Isn't that kind of embarrassing? The Democrats did not pick Milwaukee because of its socialist past. Blah, 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 blah. They picked it because they're trying to win a swing state. But the choice of Milwaukee does give left-wing Democrats an opportunity to remind the nation that socialists once played a key role in improving the life, key role, excuse me, of many Americans. 1912, some 1,200 members of the Socialist Party of America held public office in 340 cities and towns. There were socialist mayors in Buffalo, Minneapolis, Reading, Schenectady, and Berkeley. The SP had its greatest and most enduring success in Milwaukee. From 1910 to 1960, the city's voters elected three socialist mayors, as well as a number of city council and school board members. Victor Berger, an Austrian immigrant, spearheaded the party's rise to local power. The school teacher, editor of two newspaper, and dedicated organizer founded the SP with Eugene Debs in 1901 and built the Milwaukee branch into a formidable political machine. He secured the backing of unions and the most German and Polish immigrants. In 1910, Milwaukee voters sent Berger to Washington as the county's first so country's first socialist congressman. He won four subsequent victories, although in 1919 his colleagues refused to seat him because of his opposition to the First World War. Lost twice and left Congress in 1929. So I want to show you something about the SP. Okay? The sewer socialists did a lot of amazing stuff. Local political opponents dubbed these mayors sewer socialists, a term that was soon embraced by them and their supporters. Some Eastern Smarties called ours a sewer socialist, wrote Emil Seidel, the first of these mayors. Yes, we wanted sewers in the workers' homes, but we wanted much. Oh, so very much more than sewers. He sought to clean the city, both literally and metaphorically, tackling, tackling corruption while improving public work system and public health. Sewer socialism was largely born out of Milwaukee's rapid industrialization. Like so many other industrial cities, economic growth came at the expense of workers and the environment. In the 1880s, strikes and lockouts over long hours and low wages, some earned as little as one twenty-five per 10-hour day, six days a week. Shut down the city and led to bloody massacres at the hands of local militias. Does that sound familiar to you? Vic Berger Pog. I wonder if Vic's related to him. 
I wonder if Vic's burger is related to them. Companies went bankrupt or moved, leaving behind factories, scrap yards, and junk piles. Do you see this chat? The original sewer socialists were facing the same problems that cities around the country are facing today. Deindustrialization, factories going bankrupt, massive pollution. The streets were filthy. And the Menominee River, I can't even say that, was so polluted it became known as the River of Death. Corruption in city government at the time was very comparable to Chicago's with nearly 300 indictments against city officials during Mayor David Rose's term, which ended in 1910. By 1900, Milwaukee was ripe for change and thus began the city socialist era. We wanted our workers to have pure air. We wanted them to have sunshine. We wanted planned homes. We wanted living wages. We wanted recreation for young and old. We wanted vocational education. We wanted a chance for every human being to be strong and live a life of happiness. And we wanted everything that was necessary to give them that. Playgrounds, parks, lakes, beaches, clean creeks and rivers, swimming and wading pools, social centers, reading rooms, clean fun, music, dance, song, and joy for all. Doesn't that sound like something that... And notice this. This is not just bullshit. This is not just, we're going to do education. This is about building a dignified life from cradle to grave. In work and in recreation. And saying that we need to have a society that focuses on all of those things and make the city so attractive to live in that people flow there. They naturally want to live there because it has all of those things that make living worth doing. He established the city's first, city's first department of works, fire and police commissions, and city park system. In fact, Milwaukee still has one of the nation's best collection of public parks, states of public parks, thanks in part to Seidel's city treasurer and the godfather of city parks, Charlie Whitnall, who was an impassioned advocate for green space. Seidel also raised the minimum wage for city workers from $1.75 to $2 per day while successfully fighting alongside Victor Berger for an, the eight-hour workday. Why do we have eight-hour workdays? They used to be 10. We have eight-hour workdays because of sewer socialists like Victor Berger. Pretty important to know this, right? Pretty important to know this stuff. And one of the things that I would always say to somebody is, it's not bad not to know this type of stuff. It's not bad to be ignorant about our history as a socialist movement. But it's not good to say that learning it is some sort of fringe or it's not that important or i didn't know it so it must not mean that it's important for a socialist to know there's stuff that i learn that once i learned it i'm like i should have known this in his 1947 obituary the milwaukee journal summed up seidel's vision ml seidel wanted to make the city a great experiment in socialism and all his actions were unvaryingly directed toward that end edward bennett writes of daniel hone he established Milwaukee's first public housing and bus system. He embracing the sewer and sewer socialism, he also secured the municipal takeover of both waste disposal and water filtration system. Milwaukee built its first treatment plant in 1934, seeking to use access to clean water to expand the city. Hun's idea still caught national attention as one, today one of the earliest examples of public housing, and even with various setbacks, a 1940 Time Magazine article credited Hone for making Milwaukee one of the best-run cities in the U.S. When sewer socialism ruled during the first half of the 20th century, Milwaukee flourished. This is the thing I, I wanted to show you, chat, is when you build it, they will come. You make, now listen, it's Omaha, okay? You're not, it's not going to become the next New York City. It's not going to become the next LA. But instead of being a city desperate and pathetic and falling apart, investment in, in municipal Resources can work. Mocked by ide ideological purists for practicing sewer socialism, Milwaukee's pragmatic socialists focused on winning concrete gains for their working class constituents. They were known for their integrity, their tactical ingenuity, and their relentless organizing. Even today, when third party politics are more untenable and labor unions are in the decline, the sewer socialists' blend of unwavering idealism and dogged gradualism offers valuable lessons for building and sustaining a progressive working class movement. That's what I wanted you to know. That's what I wanted you to learn. When I ask people, Google this, that's what I want you to learn. That there are long historical 
examples of socialists winning and creating real concrete reforms. Now, is this enough? Fuck no, it's not enough. But it's part of a larger... Progr Isn't it... Doesn't it hearten you to know that socialists have won in America and been unbelievably successful? Did they succeed in the ultimate goal of ending capitalism? They absolutely did not. But does that matter compared to building a movement, making people's lives better? The roots of sewer socialism go back to the mid-19th century when a wave of German immigrants settled in Milwaukee. Some were refugees from the failed revolution of 1848 and been members of the Tavernian or Turners, a physical fitness move that also encouraged intellectual deliberate development and liberal, sometimes radical politics. German immigration and the Turner movement grew in the 1870s and 1880s and Milwaukee transformed into the machine shop of the world, an essential battleground for the American labor movement. In 1886, workers across the city went on strike to try to win an eight-hour workday. That campaign ended in a violent defeat when Wisconsin National Guardsmen fired into a crowd of strikers, killing seven people, including a 13-year-old boy. But workers in Milwaukee soon coalesced around the short-lived People's Party, which advocated reforms like restrictions on child labor. Later that year, the People's Party won many state assembly seats, county offices, and a seat at the United States House. Democrats and Republicans colluded to defeat the party in the next election. But its rise inspired an immigrant Milwaukee school teacher named Victor Berger to try to fashion a reformist European-style socialist party for the United States. They actually killed a... Th they shot... And notice this. Notice this. This wasn't a redneck militia. This was the Wisconsin National Guard. That's the situation that those sewer socialists were facing. And when I look at that, I think to myself, if they could organize and win in the face of that kind of repression, we can win too. I do not take this as some sort of opportunity for you and me to have despair, I look at that and say, they won anyway. We can win too. 19, 1895, Berger visited Eugene Debs, the president of the American Railway Union in a prison in Illinois. Berger brought Debs, who had been jailed for leading a national railway worker strike, a copy of Marx's Capital, a gift that Debs later acknowledged had converted him to socialism. Read theory, folks. It's not a joke. The real pragmatic leftists who won read their fucking theory. McWalkie sewer socialist mask. That's funny. That's awesome. Not long after, Berger and Debs have found the Social Democratic Party of America. Notice this, chat. This is another point I make all the time. There's not an important distinction between Democratic Socialist and Social Democrat. This is a bullshit internet-only argument. Here you have Eugene Debs, the leader of America's Socialist Party, giving somebody a copy of Marx's Capital, and then they went and founded the Social Democratic Party. And they changed the name to the Socialist Party. Milwaukee historian John Gerdick told me Berger's place was on the right side of a left-wing movement. Berger had called it nonsense to talk of suddenly, sudden bloody revolutions here. And the reason why that type of socialism wasn't popular is because the parents and the grandparents of the people who made sewer socialism work had fled Germany after failed bloody revolutions in 1848. I know that many people... You know, listen, history is one of those things that is incredibly complex, and there's so many things to learn, and the world is so huge, it's impossible to know everything. But the socialists and the leftist revolutions of 1848 and the liberal revolutions failed in much of Europe. And so a lot of people immigrated to America after failing to dethrone feudalism, failing to dethrone monarchy, failing to dethrone capitalism. A brilliant tactician, Bilger built a coerced, cohesive party by employing precinct organizers, requiring membership dues, staging youth concerts, publishing newspapers, and unleashing the Bundle Brigade, a volunteer army that could deliver the party's literature in any of 12 languages to every house in, house in Milwaukee with 48 hours. Berger's strategy, which he called the Milwaukee Idea, was to create a party that was an extension of the labor movement. This is exactly what I believe in for America, for the 21st century. Also, look at that. There were posters. They were the posters of their day. 12 languages they had the newspaper in. That is amazing. In 
In 1898, the first election in which Milwaukee socialists ran their own candidates, the party's mayoral candidate won 5% of the vote. With the public's rising disgust with the corruption of the Democratic administration of Mayor David Rose led to the steady and significant gains for socialists. And in 1910, they won 21 of 35 city council seats, 14 state legislative seats, and the mayor's office. That year, Victor Berger also became the first socialist elected to Congress. There was no need to go on a listening tour to find out what the working class wanted since so many of the party's newly elected officials were workers themselves, including the new mayor of Milwaukee, a woodcarver named Emil Slidell. The eldest of 11 children, Seidel had been forced to go to work after grammar school. He and his fellow socialists and city government, including his personal secretary, the poet Carl Sandberg, instituted dozens of measures to improve their constituents' lives. They installed hundreds of drinking fountains, prosecuted restaurateurs for serving tainted food, compelled factory owners to put in heating systems and toilets. That could really be used in an Amazon warehouse. Most significantly, Seidel appointed an aggressive new health commissioner whose department oversaw a reduction of more than 40% and the number of cases of six leading contagious diseases, among them scarlet fever, whooping cough, smallpox, within two years. Might be useful in a global pandemic to have a science-based public health policy. Monka home, it's almost like socialists tend to be class conscious. And this is why I wanted people to learn about this. This is what was so sad for me is when I was trying to explain sewer socialism, I wasn't able to answer it. Do you really think there is a solution to the problems of our society that could be spit out in 10 words? Do you think a successful uh, party strategy for producing results would be fielding, finding and vetting charismatic, politically active workers? Of course, that would be a great idea. The most widely admired trait of sewer socialists was their integrity. They never were approached by lobbyists because the lobbyists knew it was not possible to influence these men. Chicago, 80 miles to the south, was awash in corruption for decades, while Slidell's administration had largely cleaned up Milwaukee's municipal government in its brief run. But Democrats and Republicans joined forces to run a single candidate against Slidell, and he and most of the city's elected socialists were defeated in 1912. Later that year, when Debs ran for president, Slidell was his running mate, helping the Socialist Party win 6% of the vote, its highest percentage ever. One Milwaukee socialist who survived, however, was Daniel Owen. Own, the city attorney who was not up for re-election that year. In 1916, Own avenged the socialist losses by winning the mayor's office, which he held until 1940. Own oversaw further public investment, including the construction of the nation's first public housing project, Garden Homes. During Own's tenure, an urban planner named Charles Whit Whitnall designed sewer socialism's most enduring achievement, the Milwaukee County Park System, one of the most extensive and acclaimed in the country. The city added miles of new parkland along Lake Michigan's waterfront, which has been dominated, which had been dominated by private mansions. The objective is to give the best government possible, Hone once said, but not necessarily at a low tax rate, at the lowest cost that could be paid. During the Depression, he created a voluntary program in which city employees, including Hone, took a 10% pay cut to fund public works projects that put nearly 15,000 unemployed people to work. Hone forcibly rejected racism. In 1924, with the Ku Klux Klan in Milwaukee boasting more than 4,000 members, Hone declared that he would make the city the hottest place this side of hell if a KKK member attacked one of his constituents, whether he be black or white, red or yellow, Jew or Gentile, Catholic or Protestant. Zedler's commitment to his ideals ultimately cost him his political career. In 1955, he was photographed inaugurating an audition to Hillside Terrace, a public housing unit built a few years earlier. He pointedly handed the first set of keys to two families, one white and one black. That moment contributed to a racist backlash against Zedler that included violent threats against his family during the 1956 campaign. Rumors that Zedler was using city funds to pay for billboards in the South, urging African Americans to settle in Milwaukee. Those threats deterred Zedler from seeking another term in 1960, but he continued battling the real estate industry's use of blockbusting tactics, which fomented white flight and never wavered in his commitment to sewer socialism's egalitarian ideals. That is why sewer socialism failed. The exact problem that neoliberalism pretends to solve was one they created with unregulated back banks using racist redlining, and they had government funds to do it. And so when I talk about sewer socialism, when someone says, okay, Mike, what do you do? What do we do? How do we pay for all these amazing things that you want to talk about? Well, that's a really good question. And here's the thing that really pisses me off is when people don't want to know the alternative. You say neoliberalism has an answer 
And then I say, but no, progressivism, socialism, they actually have the answers to the questions that you're asking. Let me answer the question. Let me teach you. It's a sad reality that we face, that we live in a world mediated by neoliberal medium. Medium mediated by neoliberal medium. Basically, what I'm trying to say is the logic of something like YouTube or Twitch is inherently individualistic. They create incentives for personal branding to dominate solidarity. And to see that be the heart of the socialist movement on YouTube is pretty tough to swallow for almost anyone who knows anything about this kind of stuff. And when it's the end result of that, the growth of that, of radical politics led by Bernie Sanders is the conclusion that we have to support neoliberal politicians instead of just learning a little bit about how we get money. So one of the things I want to show you is I talked about suburban annexation. One thing I didn't get the opportunity to talk about was regionalism. Regionalism. Regional governance. And so there's this group called localprogress.org and it's part of a myriad amount of groups that try to get progressive people elected to local office and then give them policy ideas for what they can do that's an alternative to the neoliberal mire that we've been failing with for decades imagine thinking neoliberalism will solve the problems caused by neoliberalism and so let me talk to you about regionalism okay i want to show you the idea of regionalism that I was trying to talk, talk about yesterday. Regionalism represents a new approach to local governance that emphasizes collaboration along multiple municipalities in a metropolitan statistical area to improve efficiency, reduce competition, and strengthen overall economic and social health. Specifically, local authorities can improve and strengthen municipal revenue structures by using regional tax base sharing in conjunction with the two other pillars of regionalism, regional governance and regional land use planning. And this is something that's already starting to be done. This is something that's starting to happen already, specifically in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Regionalism has the ability to dramatically reduce inequality among residents and increase in efficiency and reduce costs in development and services and generate long-term sustainable and equitable revenue. How are we going to pay for it? Well, you can't, you can't allow white suburbs to take themselves out of the urban cores tax base spend all their money on segregated schools for white rich children and then watch taxes rise higher and higher in an urban core that is being decimated and hollowed out year after year after year if you want a solution you have to tax people where the money is which is the wealthy suburbs. That's where the money is, so that's where you have to go to get taxes. So how do you do it? Regionalism. And what are some of the ways through regionalism that you do that? Uh, let me show you. Uh, regional tax base sharing. Regional tax base sharing is a local revenue model in which various municipalities split the benefits of new development in the region. The central objectives of regional tax sharing is redistribution of fiscal resources and improved regional planning. In the United States, two major examples of regional tax sharing exist, the Twin Cities in Minnesota and the Meadowlands in New Jersey. Minnesota's Fiscal Disparities Program was established in 1971 and took effect in 1975. The program establishes a plan for seven counties in the Twin Cities region to share growth of commercial industrial property. Under the program, the counties share 40% of the region's annual CI growth using a formula based on their fiscal capacity to provide services. According to this formula, communities with greater fiscal capacity, market value per capita, contribute more than communities with less capacity. As a result, wealthier communities tend to be contributors, though two-thirds of communities have been receivers under the program. Importantly, communities levy, levy taxes after tax-based contributions. So communities that contribute more than they receive to the regional pool must increase taxes in order to sustain the same level of services. The overall effect of the program has been to reduce community disparities. Studies have indicated that tax-based sharing reduces overall property tax-based inequality in a region by about 20%. And this is the type of stuff that happens because the alternative, when you don't do re uh, uh, tax-based sharing like I'm talking about, is what happens in Ferguson, 
Do you guys know what happens in Ferguson? In Ferguson, one of the stories is that the local government with a police department that's overwhelmingly white funded itself by fines and fees of the black and brown community. They would charge them tickets for everything. Faced with lack of option, the municipality has for decades resorted to devising a system in which black communities are overly criminalized in order to maintain revenue for the city. Tickets are issued for everything from failure to cut one's lawn to sleeping over at someone's house without being on the occupancy certificate. And when people aren't able to pay the exorbitant fines, they are locked in jails and forced to pay more. The problem extends well beyond Ferguson. Throughout the typical, tragically fragmented St. Louis County, 1.3 million people are served by 115 local governments, including St. Louis City, County, and 70 other Ferguson-like municipalities, with 23 fire districts. The cost associated with all funding all 115 governments, excluding airport and water service fees, has reached a staggering $2 billion per year. In nearby Edmondson, the city averages $600 per person per year in court fines. Essentially, an additional tax on residents designed as a system for keeping the community safe. Look at this! Look at this! Other towns throughout the country derive 40% or more of their annual revenue from the petty fines and fleas collected by their municipal courts. The majority of these fines are for traffic offenses, but they also include fines for fare hopping on the light rail system, loud music, Zoning violations for unkempt property, violations of occupancy permit restrictions, trespassing, wearing saggy pants, business license violations, and other vague infractions such as disturbing the peace or a fray that give police officers a great deal of discretion to look for other violations. Recently, a legal aid group known as Arch City Defenders found a large group of people outside a courthouse in Belle Rouge, Missouri, who had been fined for not subscribing to the town's only approved garbage collection service. Despite being home to only 11% of Missourians, the 90 municipalities in the St. Louis region bring in 34% of all municipal fines and fees statewide. Further, 20 of 21 municipalities that derive at least 20% of their general budget from fines and fees and 13 of the 14 municipalities that derive their largest percent of revenue from fines and fees are located north of Olive Boulevard and within the boundary of I-270. This region is 62% black and 22% of citizens are below the poverty line, which compared to St. Louis County as a whole, which is only 24% black and 11% below the poverty line. This is the point I was trying to make. White flight, suburban areas don't pay taxes to support the municipality that they are actually parasiting off of. And the city itself is subsidizing the suburbs, even though the rich people live in the suburbs. And this is why annexation regionalism are solutions to the revenue problems to pay for the sewer socialism i was trying to explain so that is the picture and this is just a small picture i hope you guys and gals and non-binary pals have learned something about what progressive politics would look like at the municipal level and you've seen the successes of the past you've seen the successes of the past through things like sewer socialism and you look and you join and you look into groups like local progress who show you an alternative to the gerrymandered redlined block busting suburbs that dominate America and are destroying our state and local governments. And I can tell you something talking to fortune 100 CEOs or fortune 1000 CEOs is not a solution to Omaha's problem. And somebody who tells you it is, is doing nothing more than building their own Rolodex. So when they're done being mayor, they can go work as a lobbyist for those corporations themselves. We do politics here every morning starting at 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific. You can watch us here on Twitch. We're the morning guy, the morning politics guy, politics frogs in every single day, same time, 10 a.m day in day out and we carry you through your morning and early afternoon politics needs and if you need more mike from pa we have a youtube channel we talked about suburbs the my pillow guy ted cruz we talked about dsa amazing making fun of tim pool amazing look at all of these amazing videos Get in there, watch them. We have me on Twitter. You gotta follow me on Twitter, chat.
I'm at 20,614 subs. That means I got like 40 followers on Twitter in the last day. You can do better than that. You can do better than that. Go follow us on Twitter. And of course, join the Discord, where we have an incredible community of left-wing streamers. We have left-wing community. We talk about the stream. We talk about politics. There's gaming content. It's a really awesome, supportive place. Direct action, mutual aid. And you can just let off some steam. And also, you can help produce the show. One of the things I do is I look at the links that are put into the news content suggest suggestions chat room on the Discord. Join the Discord, come hang out, and uh, maybe what you want me to talk about will be part of the next show.